everyone. Um, welcome to this uh, Think Global presentation. Uh, we're going to be talking today about epilepsy, a model of care embedded in culture. Um, here we have a, a number of our students uh, here are listening to this talk midday. And I want to also welcome our European and African uh, colleagues who are, are um, going to be joining us as panelists, but also as guests. Um, thank you for joining us, and thank you for giving us some of your evening time to um, join us today. So um, a few announcements just so that everybody knows. For In addition to our live audience, we have attendees joining us on Zoom. Um, and we would love to have questions from anyone as we go through, whether you're in the room or on Zoom. So during the Q&A period, after the speakers all present, if you're online, you can put your questions into the Q&A tab and we'll get to as many as we can. Also, today's event is being recorded and will be posted online after the event. So bear in mind, bear that in mind um, uh, during the discussion. All right, so um, those are our brief um, announcements. I wanna, oh, wait a second, we actually didn't practice this. So <laughs> let me, uh, I'll go back. So I, as a very, very brief introduction to epilepsy, epilepsy is a neurologic illness that results um, seizures or, or convulsions um, or non-convulsive seizure events happen due to disruption in the electrical activity of the brain. Um, that This is how we conceive of um, seizure disorders and epilepsy um, in the U.S. However, when we go to the global stage, epilepsy is really um, thought of and considered in many different ways, and we'll be talking about that a little bit today. Um, so epilepsy is the is the core of our research and our work, but really everything that we say today is really focused upon doing research and infrastructure building and clinical care um, in various cultures and the need to really be aware of the culture where we're working as we, as we to, to be maximally effective. And a lot of times we think about culture in terms of what the community or the patients believe and think. But I wanna expand our discussion today to talk about uh, uh, culture as encompassing the infrastructure um, where we are treating patients or where we are doing research um, because those infrastructure impacts are also quite considerable. And it's a part of the culture of the place of that one is working about how an illness is conceptualized, prioritized, um, and, um, and where it is on the agenda. So joining me today, we have a number of folks that will hopefully paint this picture of our work in Uganda, Africa, as an example of, doing, of, of considering the culture of care. Um, as we do our, our research and infrastructure building projects. So I probably should have said in the beginning, my name is Deborah Poltai. I'm a tenured associate professor um, in the departments of neurology, neurosurgery, and psychiatry. Much of the work that I'll be talking about today, all of the work that I'll be talking about today, extend through the Duke Division of Global Neurosurgery and Neurology, DGNN. Many of you have probably heard of that group. Um, and we'll be talking about it a little bit more. Dr. Angelina Kakuza um, is a, a colleague and a friend of mine um, who's at the Macquarie College of Health Sciences. She's an associate professor and child neurologist in the Department of Pediatrics and Child Health at Macquarie. You'll be meeting her after my presentation. Dr. Kenneth Kalani is a master's in medicine and psychiatry at Macquarie University, and importantly for this talk, a senior medical officer at the Ministry of Health in Uganda. And then Pradamesh Ramasubra Manian. I'm gonna try one more time. Ramasubra Manian. Good? Okay. Um, uh, who is a Duke um, University senior studying biology and global health 
um, and Pradamesh has worked with our epilepsy research teams for the last two years. Um, and we're not about to, to let him go. So he'll be um, offering the student perspective. Um, I wanna acknowledge that the work that you'll be hearing about is really um, a result of very deep uh, and rich uh, collaborations between DGNN, um, supported by the Duke University Bass Connections projects. Um, we've had four projects, all in epilepsy care in Uganda, where students have had the opportunity to solve problems and learn about epilepsy and contribute to progressing epilepsy care in Africa. Um, UCB Pharma, um, uh, the Division of Societal Responsibility has supported our work. And then very, very importantly, our collaborations with Macquarie University and the Ministry of Health have been indispensable. And here's a picture of some of our colleagues. Um, this is a very, um, again, rich collaboration that has spanned a number of years we work very closely with the neurologists and psychiatrists, both of whom treat epilepsy in Africa. Um, and you see Dr. Hagen, Dr. Tony Fuller, um, key players in DGNN, of course. Um, and then um, Dr. Neil Prose, I think is online, is a, a co-lead with me on our uh, recent Best Connections projects. Um, so our first um, couple of years of work um, resulted in a special issue of epilepsy and behavior where we published the results of research that really examined the barriers to epilepsy care in Uganda. And I'm sure that Dr. Kakuza will be talking about this a little bit, but epilepsy is incredibly treatable. Okay, I, I think it's really important to understand this, that 70 plus percent of patients with epilepsy can be can have their symptoms resolve to under control um, with anti-seizure medication. And then for those where anti-seizure medications don't work, there are also a number of potentially uh, more, uh, uh, surgical um, interventions and other interventions that can be used to manage um, the seizure disorder. Yet despite this, in a large part of the world, including Uganda, Africa, the treatment gap or the gap between those needing care and those getting care is 90 to 95%. So there's an incredible, there are incredible barriers, plural, to getting patients to care. And our research tried to understand what some of those barriers are. And so we really spent a lot of time trying to understand the landscape of epilepsy and epilepsy care um, in Uganda prior to um, launching any kind of inter infrastructure building um, types of projects. So we interviewed stakeholders, we interviewed community members, we interviewed hospital providers, um, and really we, we took away a number of really important messages that really gave us an idea about the culture and landscape of epilepsy in Uganda. So, as you know, what I said, epilepsy is a chronic non-communicable non disease with a high rate of psychiatric comorbidities, all of which can impact um, functional abilities and, um, and uh, well-being. Two out of three Ugandans believe in spiritual causation as a potential either a soul or mixed contributor to seizures, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And because of this, and because of the pervasive belief that epilepsy is contagious, stigma and discrimination against those that suffer from the disease is incredible. Um, and I'll let my colleagues talk about that a little bit more. In a large national community um, sample, we, uh, we asked about beliefs about epilepsy. So these were folks in the community, randomly selected national sample, um, and about half of the people believe that people with epilepsy should not marry. A third believe that they shouldn't go to school. Half, they shouldn't be a normal part of society or play with others. Um, so you can see that there's a great deal of misunderstanding about the potential for people with epilepsy to live a very normal life with treatment. Um, 
And so this is again, the pervasive dominant belief. Um, and then importantly, you see down in the lower corner, um, uh, one of the biggest problems or challenges is that epilepsy is really thought of as a contagion. So if you have people who are largely untreated and having seizures and being regarded as being um, contagious or infectious, then again, the stigma, the discrimination is quite incredible. Um, and it really keeps people from getting the help that they need. It increases injuries, illnesses, morbidity, mortality, um, and, um, and just perpetuates stigma. <clears throat> and so you can see here again in a community sample, unaffected community sample, up to 37% believe that you can get epilepsy if you touch someone while they're having a seizure. Um, one out of four believes you can get it if they're not having a seizure and you touch someone with epilepsy. Um, I interviewed mothers of small children with epilepsy who asked me if it was contagious, who were still concerned that it was, even though they had reached hospital care and education that it was not. It is an incredibly pervasive belief. And if you think about COVID in the last couple of years and how people have sort of the alarm um, with which people regarded the illness and regard someone who's sick, right? If someone starts coughing next to you, what do you do? What do we think? Uh-oh, right? I got to move away, right? We don't go to their aid. And it's very much the same thing, but much worse because the beliefs about causation include um, the idea that um, the ancestors might be upset or it might be witchcraft or demonic possession. And so while a large number of people about, you know, probably a quarter of the sample believe that, um, uh, that epilepsy is caused by biological forces, the remainder, so three out of four, believe that actually it's a socio-spiritual um, um, uh, illness or a mix. Maybe it's a head injury or maybe it's that somebody put a person. Um, and so this is important, right? Because it impacts how people seek care. And in the samples that we um, interviewed, over half of the sample actually sought care through a traditional or faith healer prior to going to uh, biomedical um, care. And what's important is that the delay to care by making a stop at a traditional faith healer first is on average two years. So if you think about how much stigma and how much illness and how much injury and the potential for, again, cognitive morbidity, functional morbidity can happen in two years of an untreated neurologic disease, right? Um, and that's the average, which means that there's a whole bunch that are delayed even more. And so there's just a great deal of misunderstanding of where to get care um, and how easy it is to get care. And so, um, uh, and amongst our traditional healers, there are herbalists and some of those herbalists use herbs that have anti-epileptic properties. So in some cases, there may be some improvement, right? But there are also plenty of spiritualists that are not providing any kind of biomedicine in any form. Um, and when one does seek a care from a traditional healer and a hospital at the same time, there's the challenges of the potential for interaction, which I'm sure Dr. Cucuzzo will talk about. So understanding people's beliefs is a really important part of understanding the culture. If one is gonna talk about building infrastructure or building care, it doesn't matter how much you build if you drop 17 hospitals to treat epilepsy, if the community doesn't regard it as something that you go to a hospital for, that's not gonna help, right? So there's community beliefs that are a part of it. And then there are also infrastructure challenges. So we found that income and education and beliefs about epilepsy together could help us to predict who was gonna go where first, which is important information because it helps us to tailor our educational interventions appropriately. Um, and then I just wanted to briefly um, talk about the most recent project that we had, 
um, uh, what, that reached implementation so far. And that's where we um, uh, uh, designed uh, inter uh, not an intervention, an education program for frontline healthcare providers um, about epilepsy care. And as the foundation for this um, education program, we use the MHGAP epilepsy module that's put out by the World Health Organization. But we tried to tailor this to Uganda to make it more culturally relevant um, and effective. And so looking at where the Ugandan clinical guideline, guidelines were and what MHGAP was uh, suggesting, and then talking with neurologists and psychiatrists, both in the US at Duke, as well as at Macquarie, and then really adding sections um, to that training program is what we did. And Pradamesh, I think, is gonna talk a little bit about this, but we updated the prescribing rubrics. We added a section on types of epilepsy. I say we generously, that was really Dr. Kakuza. Um, and then we also added with Dr. Prose's help um, uh, sections on culturally relevant and sensitive communication with patients with epilepsy in Uganda. And so um, Dr. Kalani may mention this, but this turned into um, what we were gonna just pilot as a small education um, study. We wound up partnering instead with the Ministry of Health and rolling it out as a part of their national training agenda. Um, we also did some research and the research showed that as a result of training, healthcare providers, um, it's called the ADEP training, Advancing Delivery of Epilepsy Treatment. Um, and we did a study um, of the 60 participants that got the initial training at the three regional, uh, at three regional referral hospitals. We saw significant pre to post test gains both low and high baseline scores improved as a result of the training. And item analysis showed areas where a third of the sample improved their knowledge. So those were sort of big shifts in, in knowledge change. And almost all of those had to do with prescribing and medication management. Um, suggesting that the changes that the BAS students made um, in conjunction with our experts had a significant impact on learning and hopefully care as well. Um, and those impacts are on provider knowledge, um, training the trainer, and then Dr. Kalani might talk about um, the current update to the Ugandan clinical guidelines that are underway that are gonna incorporate some of these. So um, this is my summary slide and I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues in a moment. But really I wanted to talk about, you know, when we are working, doing our work, our research, our clinical infrastructure building, it's really very essential to be respectful, to try very hard to understand the beliefs and attitudes and knowledge of the people that we're serving, both at the frontline patients and families, um, but also at, at the community level. What is the community setting and how can we impact the community setting so that people aren't shunned, but instead they're accepted and get and supported in getting care. Um, how can we reach policymakers and even healthcare providers that may or may not understand epilepsy as a treatable disease? Um, and then there's the care infrastructure that's important um, that the ministry has a lot of um, uh, responsibility over in terms of the um, medicines availability and the workforce availability. And then there's the policy and resource allocation levels where the expenditures um, per person are considered access standards and then enforcement of those standards. Um, so, you know, I, I sometimes say it's like, um, you know, it, on, my, uh, on days where I might feel a little overwhelmed, which happens to all of us, it's like facing a tidal wave with a bucket, right? Um, there's, a, there's a lot of elements to trying to progress care, to progress education, to progress well-being. And yet when I look at the work that we've done, I think in large part because we've tried to understand the community that we're working with, not only the patient and family community, but the infrastructure as well, and to partner with those very, very important key players from neurologists and psychiatrists and then ministry officials, 
I think that we've been effective um, at, at moving the needle just a bit, but I'm gonna let my colleagues weigh in on that. Um, so I'm gonna, at this point, turn it over um, to Dr. Kukuza. Um, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Deborah, for the introduction and a warm welcome to all of you to this session. As I was introduced, I am a child neurologist and an associate professor here at Macquarie University College of Health Sciences. Epilepsy is quite a common neurological illness that we find a lot in our patients. And we estimate that about 10.3 per thousand population have this illness. Epilepsy is treated at various centers in Uganda, but we have specialized centers in Molago National Referral Hospital, where I work. There is also Mbarara Teaching Hospital, which is in Western Uganda. And then we have Butabika, which is a mental hospital and is within Kampala. You will notice that epilepsy in Uganda is viewed as a mental illness. So you find many times the patients go to attend the mental health clinic because they believe that epilepsy is a mental illness and that's where they'll seek care. So these centers provide epilepsy treatment to the patients, but most of the time, the drugs that we use are the first generation drugs, for example, carbamazepine, phenobarbitone, and sodium valproate. Those who are able to afford the second generation, third generations, have got to do that on a private basis. So they buy these drugs on their own because at times the government is not able to be able to purchase these drugs for them. But all in all, many of the patients are being managed quite fairly well on the first generation drugs. But based on the research that we have carried out with the Duke collaboration, we have noted that there is an average two year delay before the patients come to the treatment that is appropriate for them. This two year delay is very, very significant because if patients are going to take two years before they come and receive the appropriate anti-seizure medication, just imagine the complications that the complications that they undergo, the times where they get injuries, all because of the delay in terms of seeking treatment. And where do these patients go first? They first go to the traditional healer or to the spiritualist because of their beliefs. They believe that epilepsy is a demonic illness or is something that is related to witchcraft. Somebody has placed a spell on someone, so they have to go to the traditional healer because they believe the traditional healer is the one to settle the case, which is quite unfortunate because you find that many times the traditional healer will delay their treatment. And by the time they come to us, they are not yeah. able to, by the time they come and seek our care, they have undergone so many other complications. And sometimes you find that the patients are in addition to traditional treatment, also receiving the Western medication. So that mixture also has its own complications because the patient is not yet decided, do I stop the traditional medicine and go on to the Western medication? So you find that that really brings a challenge. Based on our collaboration and what we found, we realized that it's important to be culturally sensitive regarding the management of these patients. Because if you're not sensitive to what their beliefs are. You're not going to be able to win them over and they're able to come for treatment. So based on the research that we have carried out, we've learned all these issues that we need to address in terms of raising awareness, in terms of educating these patients, and also enabling them to seek appropriate care. It was because of this collaboration and the work that we're able to get what we're able to produce with a Duke collaboration, we were able now to use this as preliminary data to apply for an R01, um, R01 grant with the NIH. We were very successful. 
And right now we are carrying out a study which is nationwide to study epilepsy and its comorbidities. In addition, we're going to look and focus on adolescence and stigma. All this began because of the collaboration and the partnerships that we developed with Duke, which have been very fruitful. And we do hope that in the future, we shall be telling you more regarding the output from the study results that we shall be getting. I'll stop here and thank you so much for listening. Yep, so we're gonna welcome now Dr. Kawani, um, who from the Ministry of Health, um, who's gonna join us. There we go. Hello. All right, you are, you're on mute, Dr. Kawani. We all do it. Okay, so, <laughs> so I, I hope you can hear me. Uh, yes, we can. Yeah. Yep, welcome. All right. so, and thank you so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me to <clears throat> to make a presentation in this uh, meeting. I'm called Dr. Kenneth Kalani. I'm a psychiatrist, but also a senior medical officer at the Ministry of Health. Uh, part of what I do is uh, coordinate mental health services. Uh, okay, I'll call it MNS services. Uh, in the country because um, <clears throat> in the Ministry of Health, as Professor Angelina point, uh, uh, Professor Kakosa pointed out, that uh, uh, epilepsy or neurological conditions is, uh, is put under the umbrella MNS disorder to mean mental neurological and substance use disorders. So as a division, we coordinate all those this orders in, in, in that bracket and <clears throat> epilepsy is, is one of those that uh, we coordinate the care of. In Uganda, basically epilepsy is, um, um, is in, epilepsy care is integrated into primary health care. That means uh, every uh, primary health care worker should be able to take care of a patient with epilepsy or at least identify and provide basic care. That is what we want because as a country, we recognize that uh, uh, we cannot have enough specialists to take care of uh, the patients with epilepsy because the prevalence is high, as uh, the previous speakers have pointed out. But that is at policy level, that is what's on paper. But if you go down to the practice, uh, epilepsy care is largely specialized as Professor Angelina was quite elaborate in it and she pointed out the, the specialist uh, hospitals that usually take care of, of these patients. But we know that it inadvertently increases the treatment gap because we have uh, very few mental health specialists and even fewer neurologists to take care of patients with, with epilepsy. As a country, we recognize that barrier. Uh, we've made several attempts to, to train healthcare workers, for example, using the MHGAP manual, which has epilepsy care as a module in it. But uh, of course, there are challenges of follow-up and supervision. So most of what happens is we deliver the training and we expect that the primary healthcare workers will take on the care and you know uh, start to manage patients with epilepsy as a way of reducing the treatment gap. But unfortunately, that's not uh, what happens. We also have a couple of challenges, as Professor Jelena pointed out, and as a ministry, we recognize that virtual issues of medicine stockouts and uh, even the budget allocation for the Ministry of Health for care of uh, patients with MNS disorders is quite small. As a matter of fact, uh, for the division that takes care of uh, MNS disorders where epilepsy care belongs, we get uh, less than 1% of the health budget, which is mega basing on the burden of epilepsy and, and the prevalence of epilepsy that we have here. 
And that is not just for epilepsy. Remember, we have other mental health conditions as well. So all those things affect uh, the delivery of, 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 of epilepsy healthcare services in the country. We have made several attempts to, to try and address these issues and hope that with continuous advocacy and research collaborations such as uh, the ones with Duke will, you know, try to raise critical evidence that will eventually uh, develop to help us as a ministry come up with workable policy options uh, to, to change the care. Because if we have critical evidence to show that, hey, the prevalence of epilepsy is high, and hey, these are what the patients uh, suffer from, and hey, you know, the medicines are not available. If we have enough evidence like that, it can influence policy options. And most of these researchers also come with recommendations that uh, at the ministry level we can pick up. So we are very appreciative of uh, the collaboration that Duke has had with uh, the researchers in the country. This not only builds the capacity of, of the Ugandan researchers, but it also helps us, uh, helps generate critical data. Uganda, like any other third world country, we we, 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 we have issues with, with the data, uh, particularly related to uh, the prevalence of certain illnesses, certain factors or drivers of, of certain illnesses or comorbidities and so on and so forth. And that has happened for epilepsy. I'll tell you that in that cluster of MNS care, epilepsy is going to be, I think, the first uh, uh, condition where we can uh, confidently say that this is the national prevalence of epilepsy. And this comes out from the collaboration with you. So it's something that is very important. And I believe uh, that, that research, again, uh, will generate very good policy options. And as a ministry, we can pick up from there to uh, to to improve uh, care of, of epilepsy. Uh, Dr. Deborah pointed out the collaboration we had, uh, where we had to um, uh, adapt the training manual or the training module of the image gap, and 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 that really helped because that collaboration again helped us train about 85 healthcare workers in the management of epilepsy using that model. And also uh, it helps uh, build the capacity of, of, of the local researchers. And I noted that uh, given that in the adaptation of that uh, MHGAP uh, epilepsy model, there are certain critical issues that we're missing out particularly an elaboration of the types of epilepsy and the specific medicines or treatments that 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 are that that correspond to the different types of uh, epilepsy was missing but after that adaptation that came out quite clearly and i believe that if we use that for the training it will really help us uh, improve the care of patients with epilepsy something again that came out in that collaboration and adaptation of uh, the mh gap uh, uh, epilepsy treatment model is uh, the adding, the adapt, ad adapting it into uh, the cultural specific material. And there was a section, the communication section that, that was added. Again, healthcare workers always face challenges on explaining certain um, con issues to patients with epilepsy, because as we've told you that epilepsy is largely viewed as a specialist illness. But again, the intention is to train even the primary healthcare workers understand <clears throat> how to treat and, 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 and build their critical understanding of a patient with epilepsy, that they can view a patient with epilepsy holistically, and look at the social cultural issues also affecting this person and the psychological issues affecting the patients with epilepsy as well. So this module bring that communication section brings out how you know you understand how you start to communicate with a patient with epilepsy, then teases out the alternative explanatory models of epilepsy and alternative care. It teases out also how a healthcare worker can explain what a seizure is in a language that is understandable to 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 our patients, the Ugandan patients factoring in the social cultural 
influences and explanations of what eclipse is. So I think it was a very good modification that uh, uh, generally was well received by by the people that we trained, and I believe it will eventually improve. In that particular modification, we look at long-term impacts of, 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 of that uh, modification or adaptation of uh, the MH gap epilepsy treatment model. Uh, we, it, 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 if, if I may explain, like after we we adapted that module, we it, it came in at the time when we were reviewing our clinical guidelines, like the main guidelines that you know the primary healthcare worker will use for treating all the common you know conditions or illnesses in the country. So we 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 used the content to modify the treatment in the UCG, and eventually we also recommended the medications that we had recommended in that manual to be incorporated in the essential medicines list. So the collaboration came in quite handy and we think that subsequently as we shall uh, print more MHLAP manuals, we shall include that modified section and that will be used for training more and more primary healthcare workers and their knowledge will be improved according to uh, the modification that we, we made and which the modification was, was for the better. The long term, we look at targeting other training institutions as well, like nursing training schools and medical schools as well, and clinical officer training schools, that we can include this image gap training module for, for, for their training. And of course, the epilepsy will be in will include the, the adapted uh, or the one that we was modified with the changes that we, we made in this collaboration. So by and large, uh, we recognize that epilepsy is burdensome as a country. We are very appreciative of the collaborations as a means. We are very appreciative of the collaborations that we've had with Duke. And we think that uh, these collaborations have yielded re results and they are continuing to yield results. And I can't wait for further research that will influence policy options that will be ultimately geared towards uh, improving uh, treatment of and, and care of persons living with epilepsy in the Uganda. Thank you so much for listening to me. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kalani. Uh, and next we're gonna have Pranamesh Ramasubramanian. Had another chance. <laughs> there we go. Uh, one of our students. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Prada Mash Ramasubramani, and I'm an undergraduate student here at Duke studying biology and global health. And for the past two years, I've been working with Dr. Kolta and our group at DGNN to talk about uh, to research epilepsy and its kind of treatment, especially in Uganda. And so, some of the things that we've worked on, we've worked on two big projects. The first dealt with kind of um, how do we have healthcare provider education to improve epilepsy outcomes in Uganda? And the second project we're currently working on is to kind of design community-based interventions to increase awareness about epilepsy. And we currently received the Fast Connections follow-on grant to continue that research. But today, what I wanna talk about is kind of my student perspective in dealing with this research and kind of mirror my student experience to how a patient walks through epilepsy once they get into the clinic and how they're diagnosed. So one of the big things that Dr. Kalani talked about was our communication module. And in that, what we do is that we highlight a patient's journey from when they first go into the clinic to when they get treated and diagnosed and how their treatment goes towards hopefully curation. So the first thing that happens is that the doctor actually meets the patient. And this is pretty similar to what we, in, in the student experience, when we actually kind of are introduced to a global health um, setting. In this case, I was introduced to Uganda. And as a student, I think it's really important that we take time to understand beyond the context of our project. What are the cultural dynamics of Uganda? What is going on in the country right now? How exactly is that going to factor into our research? And what we found was that that was really important kind of understanding and progressing our research, because as a student, you're able to connect with the people that you're helping. And in terms of how that works when a physician talks to meeting the patient 
in Uganda, what we found was that if you have that 30 seconds of conversation before you actually meet the patient and start diving into what exactly their diagnosis is, you created this increased sense of trust. And oftentimes that increased sense of trust led to greater and greater, greater and greater healthcare outcomes. But the second biggest step after you kind of make that initial connection and meet the patient is kind of actually listening. And oftentimes when we talk about communication, we think about talking to people and we don't really think about the opposite, listening. And Dr. Pros, uh, who is um, one of the other faculty on this project, really emphasized to us that listening was just as important, especially when you're dealing with a global health context like Uganda, in listening to the patient was really important to drive these outcomes because the patient is able to give you information that you yourself can't kind of understand from looking at them, from reading, from reading lab results or kind of asking them questions. And what's really astounding to us was that oftentimes within the first 17 seconds of a patient interaction in the United States, they're often interrupted by a doctor and they're not able to tell their story, which we found was really, uh, was really startling. And from a student perspective, that kind of goes the same way. And that's where one of the biggest advantages to being a student working in a global health context is, for me at least, was that when you're a student, you learn to question your own ideas, you learn to listen, and you're taught to kind of absorb the information of others. And I think working in a global health context like Uganda, it was really important for us as a team to kind of emphasize in the communication module that was really important for the physician to listen to the patient because oftentimes they get bits and gems from the patients that actually contributed to the diagnosis, which they'd have to ask pointed questions if they hadn't let the patient talk. But the third big aspect after you kind of get the story of the patient, what's wrong, what actually brought them to the clinic is the treatment and the diagnosis. And oftentimes when you're explaining epilepsy, like, um, like we've said before, there's a, there's a big stigma associated with epilepsy. And oftentimes people think that, that it's contagious. It's some sort of spirit in them. And it's very hard to balance kind of dealing with saying, questioning their own beliefs, but also being respectful and trying to, trying to make them understand that what they have can actually kind of be quelled in some sort of way. And what, one of the biggest things that we found was that um, it's really important to be culturally sensitive towards their beliefs on epilepsy, while also kind of allowing, trying to help convince them that something, there's something biomedical about their condition. And that was one of the biggest kind of barriers and one of the biggest, one of the biggest um, kind of hurdles that you have to cross as a physician when you're dealing with treating epilepsy, especially in a country where you have a lot of these spiritual beliefs back behind epilepsy. And oftentimes when you're explaining the diagnosis, what we found in our communication module, it's really useful to use sort of these um, metaphors. Let's say one of, the, one of the examples that we use was that we describe epilepsy like a scar in the brain, which is much easier for them to understand rather than us talking about brain circuits and how there's not electrical signals traveling from synapse to synapse. But another thing that we used was you have to use things that people in Uganda understand, not things that kind of we as people from a foreign country are understand, um, understand pretty well, but we don't know if they understand. So another metaphor that we use oftentimes was load shedding. And for those of you that are unfamiliar, load shedding is kind of when um, you have um, an electrical power surge in the circuit, which causes kind of the power to go on that it's pretty often happens in Uganda. And so people are pretty familiar with that. So we characterize load shedding as something that happens in the brain and that's what causes epilepsy. And oftentimes people are much more receptive to this communication when you give them something that they're physically able to understand in some, rather than something that's solely grounded in a biomedical basis that has no context, no context to something that they can relate to. And I think that's really important for, that was a really big lesson for me as a student in learning how to actually communicate with individuals that are in a different context than you, because it's really important that you adapt to their language rather than them adapting to your language. And instead of you questioning their beliefs, it's really important that we as students question our own beliefs and ask, why don't we think like them rather than why don't they think like us? 
But the final thing that um, kind of the patient journey entails is the actual treatment. And as we talked about earlier, what we did, one of the biggest things that we did was that we created the sort of treatment guide that, and we modified the MHGAP module. And we create, uh, and we kind of listed the different sorts of drugs that are available and what should be used as a first line treatment, second line treatment, third line treatment, and so forth. And one of the, two of the biggest problems that come when you have this sort of treatment are first um, compromise and adherence. Now in Uganda, we have a lot of traditional healers and with traditional healing, oftentimes you get these drug to drug interactions that occur when you have allopathic medicine combined with traditional medication. And in order to kind of quell that problem, what you have to, what we had to understand was how do we as, <clears throat> how do we as foreigners, as people who are trying to be respectful of a culture kind of say, hey, like you have to kind of balance both. So one of the biggest things for us is that we had to make compromise in kind of administering and recommending our treatment and also ask them politely to make compromise themselves instead of ingesting the traditional medication and the allopathic medication, maybe rub the traditional medication on your body so you get the same effects and ingest the allopathic medication so you get those effects without the harmful drug to drug interactions. But the second biggest thing was adherence. And, and this kind of relates, um, this kind of relates to those drug to drug interactions because oftentimes when they see the allopathic medication working, they think we can go back and we can start both the traditional medication and the allopathic medication at the same time and we won't see any of those results. And then they see these problems and then they either blame it on the traditional medication or the allopathic medication or sometimes both and completely go off of it. And so one of the biggest things that we found was that it's really important to as a um, in the education module to actually communicate with them and talk and talk to them and help them understand this is a long term thing that we have to do in order to create the solution. And I think the same thing is true for us working as working in global health context, especially as me as a student working in the global health context, just because you can't have a sole intervention and you can't make a one time change because that's not impactful. And this is seen in many global health interventions that you have to make something that's a constant change and allow it to actually fruit change in the future. But th that's essentially what my student perspective was working on this epilepsy and th in this epilepsy team in Uganda. And I'm really grateful to Dr. Koltai, DGNN, DGHI, and the Bass Connections program for allowing me to have this experience. It's a really great experience to have as a student who's never worked in the global health context before. This definitely taught me a lot beyond my global health education career. Mm -hmm.